So we've talked a lot about radiation. We've touched a little bit on the idea of radiophobia, but does it stem from, you know, nuclear accidents? Is that largely where radiophobia comes from? I've done a deep dive into this this year, which goes along with all these benign cases that I'm treating now. They're essentially you know, arthritis tendonitis, which we'll talk about. And what's really interesting is that this radiophobia is largely a U.S.-based phenomenon because the first cases, first of all, x-rays were discovered in 1895 by Rentgen. In 1898, there was the first case described of actually radiating a uh, both arthritis type things or ankylosing spondylitis or other arthritis and also tumors. Even back then, we had no idea how it worked, but there were cases pre-1900 that were already being used for that. And then in the subsequent now 120 plus years, we have this divergence where Germany and the UK are using, and all of Europe really, are using radiation routinely for arthritis and tendonitis. But in the US, it seems to be a basic, it, there was a lot a lot of it was nuclear phobia, the Cold War, like you mentioned. But another thing that's that's been talked about, there's a guy named Jason Bechta that has a really good podcast on the subject. He's out of Vermont. Um, Standard Oil, the Rockefellers and all, actually had a massive lobby group that were actually actively promoting oil over nuclear power plants. And they the, the amount of spread went from just the energy industry into the, just the general zeitgeist of, the, of our entire country. And so at that time, the radiophobia just caught on. And it was, of course, uh, uh, bolstered by World War II and seeing what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And then on top of that, you had the, you've probably heard about the radium dial workers. Uh, there was a movie, it's actually it's called The Radium Girls. These are essentially uh, women in the 1920s that were using radioluminescent phosphorus paint to paint the watches. Watch dials, yeah. Being a watch guy, you'll probably appreciate that. But they literally, that was the only source of illumination they had. So in order to keep the brushes very fine, they were literally... Uh, dipping it in the radium paint, and then after each brush, they were licking the brush to keep the the tip mm -hmm. real fine. And so they were ingesting bits of of radium, and uh, so there were a, a number of cases where they ended up getting the the radium is metabolized like uh, calcium, so it was actually incorporating into the mandible, and they were getting osteoradio necrosis of the jaw and things like that. So all of these different phenomena kind of added together became. Uh, became a big deal because prior to that, people were using radiation for all kinds of crazy things. It was in suntan lotions and waters, and there was something called vigoridine that they were using for ED that you could, <laughs> topical salves that had radiation in them. It was, there was literally no end to it. And then when all the sequelae started to come out that, hey, maybe this isn't such a good idea, that's when things took off. But now that we look back, the reality of it is, is that a lot of that was really overblown, even so much so that those radium dial painters, which we, we hear about this from day one in our residency training, there was only a small percentage, like I think 50 out of 1,500 roughly, that actually had toxic sequelae. So most of them didn't. Is there a way to quantify how much exposure they had to radiation? And that's the thing, you know, they may have licked different ways, but there, there have been some basic ideas. It was, again, we're talking about, uh, it was probably at that era, it was probably a a couple of millisieverts to the to that particular area, but it was daily for decades. Yeah. And so part of the reason why they, 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 if you actually look at the numbers, it was probably a super high exposure, but when you spread that out over such a long period of time, that's sort of the general trend. Like I mentioned earlier, it's not just the dose, it's the dose over time. It's, yep. you know, and the denominator matters a lot. And so that's why most of them actually did very well. They even used to use radium internal, na internal nasal applications in the 19... I guess 1920s to 1940s, essentially a, radi a, a radiation equivalent of a tonsillectomy or adenoidectomy. And it was done in something mm. like a half million to two million children in the U.S. and even in the armed forces. It was done routinely back then. And there's been very few adverse sequelae that were reported. I don't even know what the dose was, but it was high. Hmm. So there's a lot of cases where the exposure based on our 50 millisievert rule we talked about would just make people fall out of their chair. <laughs> but the, the actual reality of it is, is that uh, many times the, the actual uh, end results aren't as bad as we had expected. Again, hearing you say this, Sanjay, the listeners are going to be thinking, what? Yes. Because <laughs> we're all so brainwashed into believing that radiation is horrible. Right. Right. I can tell you so many stories. You know, I got patients who I've had to treat. I had actually had a guy who was involved in nuclear testing at Los Alamos in the 1940s. He's passed away now, but I saw him in his 80s. So this was in the early 2000s. This was 60 years after that. They had very little monitoring back then, but he was close enough to feel the heat from a thermonuclear bomb. And by the time I saw him, he had had 
thyroid cancer, as you would expect. He'd had a, one or two lymphomas. I think I ended up treating his prostate. So he'd had at least four or five different malignancies, but the guy was a, as functional as most 80-year-olds are. The guy was still walking and talking and doing just fine. And it actually seems that the when you look at the population studies that were done outside the blast at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, when, of course, you get the, the initial concentration, everyone dies from the thermonuclear energy. But as you get several miles out, not only are the cancer rates actually roughly the same as the background, you actually see again, evidence of hormesis where you have some patients in whom, or maybe not hormesis, but some sort of radio protection where you actually have lower rates of leukemia and thyroid cancer when you get a few miles farther out than you did in the general population. So it's all very much dose dependent, time dependent, but I think the human body, we, we're evolved really to handle this to a larger degree than we realize because again, mammalian DNA, we came from you know the background of all the animal kingdom where there was tons of exposure from natural cosmic rays and whatnot. And then you know, our, our predecessors had to be able to survive. Our DNA had to be somewhat resilient in order to get to this point. And I think it's more resilient than a lot of people give it credit for. 